are so excited and glad that you gave us a little bit of your Wednesday. If this is your first time, man, we would love to know you in some way. So if you want to scan the QR code in the seats in front of you and let us know a little bit of info about you, or if you just want to stop by one of our tables downstairs, we would love to get you connected here. One of the things we say all the time is that we're not a service you attend, but we're a family that you're a part of. And we want you to feel like family tonight, okay? So uh, we are continuing our series tonight called Death to Self. And over the last several weeks, we have been talking about how the world calls us uh, to really live for ourselves, right? To promote ourselves, to promote our own way. But the message of the Bible is a message that calls us to die to ourselves, to do literally the opposite of what the world would call us to do. And so in our first night together, we looked at Mark chapter 8. We talked about how Jesus says that whoever wants to be his disciple must take up their cross, deny themselves, and follow him. And then in week 2, we jumped to Galatians where it talks about how we are called to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh, die to the way we would walk and give way to the Spirit. And then in last week, we talked about, we jumped to Colossians, where it talks about how we are full in Christ, that we don't bring anything to the table, but we have everything that we need in Christ. And tonight, uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, where we're really going to talk about the call to live for others. If I could rename this series, really the simplest uh, name that we could give this series is just look to Jesus. Because every single week that we've walked through these passages of Scripture and looked at these calls to die to ourselves, really what we're seeing is an example of what Jesus did when he was here on earth, right? Week one, we talked about how you were to take up your cross. Well, Jesus took up his cross. He died, denied himself. I mean, the perfect picture of taking up your cross is Jesus when he did it for us, right? Uh, two weeks ago when we talked about walking by the Spirit, not by the flesh, Jesus in the New Testament repeatedly, it refers to Jesus being empowered by the Spirit, being led around by the Spirit. Like He, is, he was someone submitted to the Spirit's leading. Uh, in last week we talked about how our identity is to be full in Christ. And in my own time with the Lord, I've been reading, uh, I just finished John and jumped into Acts, but what you read throughout the Gospels are these just pictures of Jesus saying, man, I'm about my Father's business. I am full with what He's called me to do and nothing else. I mean, just consistently not giving way to anybody else or anybody else's influence. Um, and tonight really is no different. When we look at Philippians chapter 2, we see a picture of Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to read all of the passages that we're going to be in tonight. We're going to be in the first eight verses, and then we'll pick it apart a little bit together. Uh, Paul writes this to the church at Philippi. He says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Uh, The title of the message tonight is just simply this, Dying to Serve. Dying to Serve. I think what we see in this passage in Philippians chapter 2, the heartbeat here, is Paul is continuing to call the church at Philippi, much like the other churches he's written to throughout the New Testament, to die to themselves. But really, he's talking of this idea that the call to die to self really is a call to also live for others. The call to die to self is a call to live for others. Look back at the first four verses. He starts off by saying this. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness, compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And what he's saying there is he's, he's basically saying these like if-then statements, right? He's saying, man, if you really know Jesus, if you really encountered his love, if you really walk in the spirit, if you've experienced the tenderness and compassion of the Lord, then there's something that should be present in your life. And what should be present in your life is this call to live and serve and love other people. And 
The Philippian call in, in verse two is, or chapter two is this call to die to ourselves and to live for others. And it really is summed up in verses three and four when Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. What is Paul calling the church at Philippi and us to do? He says, man, don't, look, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Don't value yourselves as above anyone else, but instead look to the interest of others. The call to die to self is a call to live for others. Paul is calling us in Philippians chapter 2 in the church at Philippi to not live for themselves, but rather in humility value others above themselves. This goes hand in hand with what Jesus tells us in Matthew 22. Right? He, he says in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. When we look at the person of Jesus and we look at the word, it calls us to this life lived and in service to other people. Warren Wearsby says this, he says, there can be no joy in the life of a Christian who puts himself above others. There can be no joy in the life of a Christian who puts himself above others. And I think what he's getting at here is that when you look at Philippians chapter 2 and you just simply look at the character of Jesus, what you see is a call to live for others. In the example of Jesus, and if we claim to be disciples, if we claim to love him, as 1 John would call us to, uh, then we are to live as he did. Well, how did he live? He lived as someone who laid his life down, who called us to love other people. You and I, when we accept the call to die to ourselves, we also accept a call to live for others. I talk about uh, Layla and I's relationship all the time in C3. And one of the things that I'm really loving right now is I have like three distinct times to build my relationship with my daughter. It's on the way to school, on the way home from school, and bedtime. Those three times, that's like... Daddy-daughter time. Like, our relationship is built in those moments, right? And so when we leave every morning, my daughter gets really pumped about game time in the car. And game time in the car is not really any game that makes any logical sense at all. It really is just a series of games that require me to say a lot of words. And so one of the games we play is the favorite food game. So literally, we played this game this morning. What's your favorite food at breakfast? She answers, I answer. All right, what's your favorite food at dinner? She answers, I answer. And we do that until we stop figuring out foods to name. That's the game. It's a great game. Another game we play is the funny name game, which is me just naming every obscurely named athlete that I can think of in my mind for as long as possible. And she laughs at every single one. Debricka Shaw Ferguson gets her every time. (laughs) Every time. Um, But that's the game we play. And one of the games we play uh, is the princess game. And the princess game is I cut my Apple CarPlay off and I play a princess Spotify playlist because I have Spotify because I love Jesus and, you know, that's how, that's what you do. Uh, and so um, that, that, that just like somebody's going to like be at a different church next week. Sorry. Um, but uh, I hop on Spotify, turn my Apple CarPlay off and I play a random song and Layla just can, na- she has like 10 seconds to name the princess that's singing the song. Layla's undefeated at this game. Like if there's a name that tune for five-year-olds, we could win some money. Like, she's really good. Um, and it makes my Spotify rap playlist very strange for a 30-year-old man. But, you know, we just, we just moved through it. I've embraced that in my life, right? Uh, but one of the movies and songs that my daughter loves, and we've sang a bunch in my house, is the song Be Our Guest. You've ever heard that song from Beauty and the Beast? If you haven't, you know, get out from under a rock. Um, but in that song, those stupid candleman who sings in that song uh, says this one phrase that every time I read passages like this, I think about. He says this phrase. It's in that, you know, there'd be our guest, all the weird appliances are like waking up and dancing and stuff. And he says, life is so unnerving for a servant who is not serving. Life is so unnerving for a servant who is not serving. And the whole idea is that he was made for something that he hasn't been able to do. And so his life has become unnerving because he hasn't been able to do it. And I think that's what Warren Wearsby is trying to say here and what Paul is calling us to consider, that our life is literally unnerving. There is no joy in the life of a believer when we are putting ourselves above other people. When we're not taking the position of service for others, we are living counter to what God has ultimately saved us and sent us to do. To be the embodiment of the hands and feet of Jesus to others is to walk in service to other people. 
A call to die to self is a call to live for others. Now, as you hear that, some of you may say, man, I, I hear you. I know I'm called to serve other people, but I don't really like it. Like, I'm really all about myself. Like, I kind of like my me time. I don't really like going out of my way to, like, bless other people right now. I've got a lot of stuff on my plate. I'm extremely busy. And if that's you in the room, listen, that is a completely and totally natural response. Like, it is natural for you and I to care more about ourselves than other people. It is natural for us to love ourselves the way that we want to love ourselves. But loving our neighbor as ourself, that is not something that comes naturally to us. It's meant to be something that only the Lord can do in us and through us. And that's why Paul continues this passage of Scripture by giving us the perfect example to follow. Look at what he says in verse 5. In verse 5, Paul says this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What is Paul saying here? Paul is telling us that the perfect example of serving others is Jesus. Circle back to how I started here, right? Look to Jesus. What is Paul saying? He's saying your call, if you've encountered Christ, is to walk in unity and serve other people. How do you do that? You look to Jesus. You look to the example that he sets for us. And he calls us in verse 5, he says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus in your relationships. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus. Now, you and I are imperfect people. How do we have the same mindset as Jesus in our relationships? Well, Paul begins to show us the mindset of Jesus in the rest of this passage we're going to read tonight. And as we read it, we're going to be able to look at this example of Jesus and say, this is how I'm called to live my life when I walk in service to other people. And so for the rest of our time together, I just want to walk through the three examples that Paul gives as examples of the mindset of Jesus, okay? Here's the first one. The first example of this mindset of Jesus is that he did not think about himself. He did not think about himself. Look at what Paul writes. He says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. What you need to understand here is Paul is writing to this reality that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Meaning that he had the power of God at his disposal. That when he put flesh on, he did not become less God. Like he was fully God and fully man. That in his own power, he could have rejected the cross. He could have returned to heaven when people tried to rebuke him or challenge him. Or when things got hard, he goes, man, I've got enough of this. I'm out. I'm done with this assignment. He could have done that. He had the power to call the angels and literally just get up out of there. But time and time again, Jesus chooses not to think of himself and instead, to think of you and me. He made himself nothing, going to the cross, choosing to think about you and I more than himself and his own comforts. Because Jesus is the perfect example of service. He doesn't think about himself. He instead thinks about what the Lord has called him to do and others. He didn't think about himself. The second thing we see about his mindset here is that he took up the towel. He took up the towel. Look at how verse 7 continues. It says, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. He takes the very nature of a servant. One of the things I love when you read the New Testament, you see this picture of Jesus being an authentic, consistent servant of other people over and over and over again he walks in this nature of a servant when you read the new testament you see time and time again that jesus gave himself to the lowest of the low he associates with tax collectors prostitutes the poor and the sick and when he's rebuked he says listen I'm not here for the healthy, I'm here for the sick. Time and time and time again, Jesus embodies this service to other people. In Matthew, uh, 
chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What is, what is Matthew talking about here? It's this purpose statement of Jesus, that Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve. It's this picture here that Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of Man. If there's anybody in human history that could have kicked his feet up and said, man, bring, it, like, bring me a Diet Coke and some chips, serve me for a second. I don't know if that's your thing, but I like Diet Coke. That's a 30-year-old band thing, all right? It's fine. But Jesus could have had that, right? He could have done that. He could have been served in whatever way he wanted. But instead, he doesn't come to receive. He comes to give. He comes to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20 is this purpose statement of Jesus. It's what he came to do, to give his life away as a ransom for many. In John 13, uh, there's a picture of Jesus as the perfect, uh, just perfect example of his service. In John 13, verses 3 through 5, it says this. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now, some of you have heard this story before and some of you haven't, but this is a perfect picture of Jesus' service to his disciples. He washes his disciples' feet. But I think verse 3 is something we need to look at for just a second. Verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. Meaning, Jesus knew full well that God had sent him here, and that soon he would be sitting at the right hand of the Father again. He knows this. He's fully God, fully man. He knows this. And it's in this moment of understanding that soon he will be at the right hand of God in heaven, that immediately after, he gets up from the table, takes off his outer clothing, And picks up the towel. Jesus chooses to take the position of a servant and wash his disciples' feet. Now, the idea of like washing feet is not something that you and I are very familiar with necessarily. If you go over to your homie's house after this and knock on the door and they're like, hey, before you come in, I'd like to wash your feet. Be like, I'm going to stop coming back here because that's super weird, right? But in this day, it was very normal because, you know, people are walking through the streets in sandals, The roads were disgusting and dirty. And so it was very customary for people to have their feet washed in these types of settings. But what was very not customary, very abnormal, was this reality. That someone of this position, the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, would choose to lower himself to the place of what would normally be done by a servant or the lowest of the low in the house. Jesus is this embodiment of service that says, I'm going to take up the towel and serve these men by washing their feet. That's why Peter like pushes back. He's like, you're not going to wash my feet. Because it makes no sense. But Jesus in this moment and from the entirety of his life as we watch him, he embodies this position of service. He brings himself low. He doesn't exalt himself. He did not come to be served. He came to serve. The mindset of Jesus, not thinking of himself, taking up the towel, walking in service to other people. And so C3, we've talked about this time and time again in C3, that that, that passage in 1 John, right? Those who claim to love Jesus will live as Jesus did. Well, as we look at the life of Jesus and we look at the way in which he chose to live his life and lay his life down for others, the question you and I have to ask ourselves is this, who am I serving? Who am I serving? When you evaluate your life and when you look at your life, you need to ask yourself, who is it that is in your life that would say, man, these people are serving me? When's the last time your roommates saw Christ in you by the way in which you served them? When's the last time your classmate, fraternity brother, sorority sister, teammate, saw the example of Jesus in you by the way in which you served? And this is why, I mean, Jesus literally says things like, man, uh, they will know that you're my disciples by the way in which you love one another. 
It's this call to love and to serve and to give up our rights to ourselves and to serve other people because the call to die to self is a call to live for Christ. And as a result of living for Christ, we live for others. I know we got a lot of dream team in this room. Hey, this is why we do dream team. Like we ask and compel college students to serve at this church because we believe that when you serve, you are embodying being the hands and feet of Jesus to one another. You're not just wearing a lanyard and being awkward at a door. You're not awkward, but that's just the example that came to my mind, okay? It's not just filling a task. It's not just making the machine go forward. It's saying, I want to exemplify the hands and feet of Jesus in my local church context. I want people to see Jesus in me. So I'm going to sacrifice some time. I'm going to sacrifice some comforts. I'm going to sacrifice some things so that Christ might be seen in this church and in my life. And if I could be so bold, if you attend a church that's not cross church, or even if you attend this church, and there ever comes a time where that church has stopped compelling you to serve, then you need to seriously question your involvement in that church in the future. Because when we are called to serve, we're not called to just meet needs that the church has. We're called to embody the example of Jesus. And so I have conversations with, as a college pastor, all the time. Like, hey, I'm moving to the, uh, like, I'm not going to be in C3 anymore. I'm going to miss it so much. I, I, I really, what do I need to look for in my next church? And here's what I would tell you. One of the things you need to prioritize is how they value the local church being involved to serve and be the hands and feet of Jesus in that local church context. Because if it's not something that's happening there, you're missing out on something that you are called to do as believer. To to live as a servant that exemplifies the service and example of Jesus. So not only did he not think about himself, not only did he uh, take up the towel, but he also sacrificed for others. He sacrificed for others. Look at the back half of uh, verse 8. It says, In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Ultimately, we see Jesus' mindset here was ultimately to sacrifice his life. When we look at Jesus, we see a call to sacrifice. When we want to exemplify Jesus in our life, we are called to lay our life down so that people might see us reflecting the character of Christ around us. Jesus is the perfect example of service in that he gave his life up so that you and I can live. He walked and sacrificed himself so that you and I might find life. He sacrificed. The call to die to self is a call to live for others, and sometimes that calls us to sacrificing things in our life so that people might see the example of Jesus in us. And if Jesus would be willing to serve you and I in that way, to lay his very life down out of service to us, then what might we be willing to respond to that sacrifice with as we serve and love other people? At the end of this chapter, uh, Paul kind of closes this chapter uh, with giving a highlight of two different men. Uh, Remember, this is a letter to a church. And so at the end of chapter 2, it really gets a, really gets like heartfelt. Paul starts to talk about two people that that are coming to the church at Philippi. And the two guys are Timothy and Epaphroditus. And he talks about these two men at the end of chapter 2. And this is what he says about Timothy. I'm just going to walk through both of what Paul says about these two men. The first thing, the first guy he talks about is Timothy in verse 19. In verse 19, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and this is what he says about Timothy. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone who looks uh, out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. What Paul is essentially saying to the church at Philippi here is he's in telling them, listen, I'm so excited to send Timothy to you because here's some things about Timothy that are admirable. There's no one else like him who will show genuine care for you. What is he saying here? Timothy is a servant. 
No one else will care for you like Timothy cares for you. No one else will show genuine concern for your welfare, what he says in verse 20, like Timothy will do. He says everyone else, verse 21, everyone else looks for their own interests and not those of Jesus. But you know Timothy has proved himself. What I find very interesting about Paul's description of Timothy in this passage is not, man, I can't wait to send Timothy with you. He's got a bunch of gifts for y'all. It's not, hey, Timothy's a great preacher. He's really going to bless y'all when he gets down there. It's nothing about his accolades. It's not about his work. It's nothing about anything like that. The descriptive words from Philippians chapter 2 about Timothy is that this man is a servant who sacrifices and lays his life down for other people. That's the description of Timothy here. And then he jumps to describe Epaphroditus. That's a name, right? Epaphroditus. Verse 25, he says this. He says, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Verse 26. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, and he almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that, you, that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Verse 29. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. What is Paul saying about Epaphroditus here? He says, man, receive this man with great joy. Honor people like him. Why? Because he was willing to literally risk his life in service for others. Again, Paul is not applauding Epaphroditus for some sort of skill that he brings to the table, not sort of uh, not, not any amount of money that he's bringing or whatever it may be. What is applauded about Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2 is that he is willing to lay his life down and potentially die for the good of those around him. He's a servant. And the theme we see in Philippians chapter 2, time and time and time again, The example of Jesus, the example of Timothy, and the example of Epaphroditus is what? An example of men who laid their life down so that they could live for others and live in service to other people. Time and time and time again, a picture of Epaphroditus, Timothy, Jesus, Paul, all these men that are exemplified in Philippians chapter 2 are men who don't think about themselves. They take up the towel and they sacrifice for the cause of Jesus call to die to self is a call to live for others, C3. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, man, who is it that I'm serving? Like, who am I, who am I serving? And if the answer is hard to come up with, then I can tell you what your answer is. Your answer is yourself. If you can't name who it is that you're serving on a consistent basis, then it probably means that you're taking up a lifestyle of serving yourself. But the call of the believer is not to serve ourselves or our own comforts or our own way. The call of a believer is to die to ourselves that we might live for Christ. And by living for Christ, we follow his example to live and sacrifice for others. So who are you serving? You know, we can read passages of scripture like Philippians chapter two and hear stories about Epaphroditus who almost died for his church. And hear stories about Timothy who's this like awesome pastor in, uh, in the New Testament. It's like, oh man, that's, that's awesome. He's a servant. That's great. That makes sense. But one of the things I love uh, about just thinking about this example of service is I've had the privilege of being the C3 pastor in May. This will be like uh, May. I'm getting to five years doing this. And I've, getting, I've gotten to be in C3 for that long. But C3 is old, y'all. C3 has existed since 2011. That's when I graduated high school. And I'm a long way from high school, y'all. It's old. And so if I can just give you like a picture here of what it looks like for the church to just faithfully follow the example of Jesus. We stand in a building today on the shoulders of many men and women that you will never know. You will never know their name. You may never see their face. They will never be written about or stories told about them. But these men and women have been modern day Epaphroditus and Timothys to this church. 
Men and women like Jackson Ford and Joe Reynolds and Emma Dalby and Olivia Lepp and Hannah Breath, Ashton James, Hannah Corley, Luke Humphrey, Reed Frazier, Ashton Johnson, Ethan Jurek, Lauren Lamker, Abby Hagner. Some of you, these are just names. And you've never seen them. You don't know them. And you maybe never will. But some of you, you go to a community group on Tuesday nights and their story is written and some of their story includes the names that I just read. And some of you go to community groups where the guy, like Ethan Jerk, invested in somebody who invested in somebody who invested in somebody and now he's leading your group. And you'll never know their name and you'll never see what they've done and you've never, you're, you're never gonna know the amount of times that they sacrificed. You're never going to know the amount of times that they woke up and prayed for people that were not themselves. You're never going to know the ways in which they sacrificed study hours to build and to labor at this church. But we stand here today in 2024 in this building and in this college ministry on the shoulders of men and women who were faithful to say, I want to exemplify Jesus in my four years in college. I want to lay my life down to be the hands and feet of Jesus that people might see Jesus in me. And it's their faithfulness to commit not to uplift themselves, but rather to lay their life down so that people might see Jesus in them, that we stand here today and get to look back of the generations of college students that have influenced this church. That's not just college students. I mean, there's people all across our church. I can tell you story after story of that. Some of the greatest people in the world that I will miss at Cross Church one day is Randy and Elaine Goad. Some of you know them, some of you don't. But they make some incredible enchiladas. And every time you eat in this church, it's probably been made by Elaine Goad. And they're retired, but their schedule is filled by being the hands and feet of Jesus to college students at this church. And there are men and women who are encountering the presence of God simply because they're willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus. This is what the church is called to do. And so for some of you, you may say, man, Luke, I'm really too busy for that right now. Some of you may say, like, I mean, I don't even know what I would do. I'm really enjoying this whole, like, sit in C3 and then leave thing. And I would just tell you, if that's you, can I just compel you? You you are called to more than that. This entire series we've been talking through, it's a call to die to yourself. And so you really need to ask yourself this question, man, is is it costing you anything to be a Christian right now? Is it costing you anything? to be a Christian right now, if it costs Jesus his very life to give it to us, then shouldn't it also cost us something? A call to die to ourselves, a call to walk by the Spirit, a call to be full in Christ on a day-to-day basis, and then a call to be the hands and feet of Jesus so that others might see Christ in us. And listen, I know we got a lot of dream teamers in this room, so they're all like, man, I serve. What, what more do you want me to do? And here's what I would tell you. Let this be the reminder of why you do what you do. Let it be the reason that you go to that community group with joy in your heart because you know you're not doing this for Noah. And you're not doing this for me. And you're not doing it for your friends. You're doing it to be the hands and feet of Jesus and walk in faithfulness to your king. And so you go in that house on Tuesday nights and you labor for those girls and you labor for those guys and you believe in faith that they're going to grow and you serve not for anybody other than the Jesus who's given you the example of service to follow. Some of you, you hold babies across the street on Sunday mornings and you're changing diapers. God bless you. And there are times when you want to sleep in and bail on Rachel Cobb, who's asked you to come. But it's in those moments that you remind yourself, in this moment, I'm being the hands and feet of Jesus so a mom and dad can sit under the preaching of the word of God and walk in faithfulness to their king by when I'm walking in faithfulness to mine by serving this preschool room. We don't serve because the church needs help. We don't fill roles because the church wants you to. We serve to embody the nature and personality of Jesus. That's what we're here for. That's why we do what we do. And so I'll close with this because I'm getting a little sweaty. I'm going to close. But here's the close for you. Who are you serving? And what is it costing you to be a Christian? It doesn't mean you have to serve on the dream team, but in some way, shape, or form, you need to be looking at passages like this and knowing, man, I'm called to give my life away for other people because that's exactly what Jesus did. Maybe for some of you, that means that 
that you need to sign up and like do something. You need to serve in some way tonight. Like you need to say, man, before I leave tonight, I need to figure out what I'm going to do. Others of you, and you can't live for others because you've never chosen to live for Jesus. You need to just give your life to Jesus tonight. Like you, can't, you can't even start serving others in a way that actually is lasting apart from a saving relationship with Jesus. And so tonight, some of you might need to do that. Others of you, maybe you just need to release like the ways in which you are serving back to the Lord. Say, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing it for anybody else. This is for you. I mean, some of you need to go to your roommates. Like when you go home, man, you just need to be like, you're not my enemy. You are an example for me to serve. And I'm going to choose to serve you tonight. Don't tell them that. That'd be, well, you could, I guess. But if the Holy Spirit tells you to, do it. But just don't be weird, okay? I don't know what the response of the Lord would lead you to tonight, but I know this. You are called to exemplify the person of Jesus in your life, and you cannot do that faithfully apart from serving and loving other people because that's the example we have in Christ. And so whatever the Lord would compel you to do in that, my encouragement to you is to listen and to obey. I promise you, you will not regret that. So let me do this. Let me pray. Uh, and then we're going to sing one more song to close our service tonight. Uh, God, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for who you are and for what you do. Lord, I pray over this room right now. I know there's a ton of different people just in this room. we got people who are serving on Dream Team, to people who are new for the very first time, people who don't even know you as their personal Lord and Savior tonight. I, I know that every single one of them are in the room right now. And so, Lord, I just pray for every single one of us that we would be more committed to looking like Christ than our own comforts and our own desires. Whether that means that we serve for the very first time or we just recommit to serving the right way, whether it means that we need to give our life to Jesus for the very first time tonight, whatever it is, God, I pray that you would lead us to faithfulness. Lord, we want to look like you. We want to do what you call us to do. So I just ask in this moment that as we jump into this next song and we begin to worship again, God, that we would authentically respond to who you are. And in our response to you, we would do whatever it is that you call us to. We ask this all in your awesome, holy name. Amen. Uh, C3, do me a favor. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing together. If you need to talk to anybody or pray or anything like that, some of our staff will be in the back. We'd love to talk with you. All right? Let's sing together. So I throw up my head.